I am James Bradley, and this is Untold Pacific, a podcast series which mines 40 years of my life in Asia and my four best-selling books to create historical travelogues about the American experience on the other side of the Pacific. When America's founding fathers signed the Declaration of Independence in 1776, none of them had ever heard of Hawaii. They knew London, Athens, Cairo, Cape Town, Bombay, Sydney, Shanghai, but not Hawaii. Hawaii wasn't even discovered until 1778, and they called it the Sandwich Islands. The Hawaiian Islands are further away from anything than anything in the world. If you're in Hawaii, you're further away from the next landfall than you are at any other point of the planet. Hawaii was one of the last things ever discovered. The world of the average Hawaiians began its downward slide when the first Westerner, Captain James Cook, supposedly discovered them in the islands in 1778. Observers on Cook's ships wrote that the Hawaiians were very healthy-looking people. Scientists now know that before contact with the whites, the Hawaiians were an exceptionally well-nourished, strong, and vigorous people. It's now almost certain that Hawaiians in 1778 had life expectancies greater than their European counterparts. Cook and his crew were the first Westerners to behold healthy Hawaiians, and they would be the last. Along with great white civilization, Cook brought the Great White Plague to Hawaii. We now call it tuberculosis. And when Cook had shoved off from Tahiti towards Hawaii, more than half of his crew were too sick from venereal disease to work. When they reached Hawaii, Cook commandeered a sacred Hawaiian house of worship and converted it into a hospital, and the locals cared for the sick sailors there. Eventually, Captain Cook sailed away. Seven years passed. In 1786, a French ship reached Hawaii. The ship's surgeon saw that Hawaiians were suffering from many, many diseases. Their children were now weak, and the adults were dying early. Soon, American whalers and merchants from New England visited the islands. Then, American missionaries sailed out to save the pagan Hawaiians. The missionaries soon forbade the Hawaiians' easy ways. The hula was too sensual. Surfboarding with the half-nude, dark-skinned natives exposing themselves as they rode the waves, oh my God, this was judged indecent by the missionaries. A white sailor who revisited Honolulu in 1825 wrote, The streets, formerly so full of animation, are now deserted. Games of all kinds, even the most innocent, are prohibited. Singing and dancing are punishable offenses. The University of Hawaii's Social Science Research Institute now estimates that the population of Hawaii in Captain Cook's time was probably more than a million people. Just two generations later, in 1832, the first missionary census found that only 130,000 had survived. But to American missionaries who came from a country in the midst of cleansing its own natives, the decline of a non-white race was thought to be God's will. One missionary wrote that Hawaiian deaths were like the amputation of diseased members of the body. Back in the U.S., Mark Twain joked, The Hawaiians suffer from various complicated diseases, and education, and civilization. Maybe we should send a few missionaries to finish them off. Like so many other colonial adventures, saving souls was a secondary consideration. Imperialism's great success story was the production of sugar from tropical sugarcane fields. From Jamaica to Jakarta, slaves toiled under the lash to produce profitable sugar. American settlers noticed Hawaii's fertile soil, constant sunshine, plentiful rain, and easy access to good ports, and saw before them a sugar producer's dream. In Hawaii, there's a well-known saying that the missionaries came to do good and stayed to do well. One who did just that was Reverend Amos Cook, who was born in Danbury, Connecticut, and educated at Yale. Reverend Cook had sailed to Hawaii in 1837. 
In Hawaii, he ran the royal school to educate the future kings and queens of Hawaii. Reverend Cook's first step was getting titled to valuable Hawaiian land. Buying land was complicated. The Hawaiians had little notion of private property or cash exchange. They didn't understand how a transaction could deprive them of land. Reverend Cook helped convince King Kamehameha III to institute a revolutionary land reform. Suddenly, whoever had money could buy as much land as he wanted. Soon the terms missionary and planter became synonymous. Back in Washington, D.C. in 1848, the U.S. House of Representatives Committee on Naval Affairs held hearings. The subject? How America Might Span the Pacific. The government was already subsidizing four steamship lines in the Atlantic and the Caribbean. A Yankee line across the Pacific would be a significant boon to American commerce. But while steamships could conquer the Atlantic, the Pacific was far too wide. The Pacific Ocean is the largest physical feature on the planet. If you take all the world's land masses and place them into the Pacific, there's still room left for an additional Africa, Canada, United States, and Mexico. The Pacific is two and a half times larger than the Atlantic Ocean. It hides mountain ranges that dwarf the Himalaya. The most compelling witness to testify before the committee was the Navy Department's chief oceanographer, Lieutenant Matthew Morey. Lieutenant Morey placed a large globe before the committee's congressman. Then he bent over his satchel and he took out a long piece of white string. He placed one end of the string on San Francisco. Then he ran the string across the Pacific to the next landfall, the Hawaiian Islands. Steamships could reach Honolulu, which was 2,100 miles from San Francisco. But it was the next leg which was the problem from Honolulu to Shanghai, a distance of 4,700 miles. Marine engines of the time burned so much coal that if you took enough coal along to fuel such a long journey, there'd be little room left for any other cargo. All the congressman's eyes were fixed on Lieutenant Maury's globe as he ran the white string from Hawaii to Shanghai. The congressman could see that the string ran through Japanese islands on its journey to Shanghai. Mori explained that if they established a coal depot on one of the Japanese islands, the steam trip to Shanghai was possible from the United States. Honolulu to Japan was a distance of 3,200 miles. After coaling on a Japanese island, a steamship could easily make the last leg from Japan to Shanghai, a distance of 1,500 miles. The implications of this simple demonstration were staggering. At that time, a letter or a person or a pinch of tea now took 80 days to travel the British route from New York to Shanghai. They had to go across the Atlantic, around Cape Town. This was a distance of 20,000 miles. By exploiting the strategic location of Hawaii and then Japan, the U.S. could reduce the journey's lengths by two-thirds. Lieutenant Morey said to the hushed room, It is now within America's power to establish and control the most rapid means of communicating with China. Lieutenant Morey was suggesting America's commercial domination of the Pacific. Back in Hawaii, Reverend Cook, along with fellow missionary Samuel Castle, founded the Castle and Cook Company in 1851. Castle and Cook grew quickly to become the third largest company in Hawaii. It went on to become one of Hawaii's largest landowners, one of the world's largest sugar producers, and it was one of the infamous Big Five companies that controlled the Hawaiian government throughout much of the 20th century. Sugar plantations required many workers. Hawaiians, with their easy ways, were considered by the Americans to be poor candidates for hard labor. If Hawaii had been settled in the 18th rather than the 19th century, slaves would have been imported. But with changing times, the Americans brought in contract laborers from China and Japan. They were bound to serve at fixed wages for three to five years. A small community of white Americans soon came to control the land, but they were soon outnumbered by the contract laborers. So the Americans opposed democracy for Hawaiians. 
they realized that if you give Hawaiians suffrage, even just male suffrage, it would produce a government of non-white, non-Americans. The U.S. Navy Department was soon describing Hawaii as the crossroads of the Pacific, a link to the commerce of Asia. A treaty in 1875 was forced down the throats of the native Hawaiians. It eliminated tariffs on Hawaiian sugar into the United States, and it granted America exclusive rights to maintain military bases in Hawaii. When this treaty was approved, Hawaiians took to the streets in protest. The protests turned violent, and the king requested American protection. About 150 U.S. Marines swatted the protesters away. Sugar exports soared over the next decades. A white man in Hawaii observed, Nearly all the important government positions are held by Americans, and now the islands really are an American colony. White Americans who wanted to overthrow the Hawaii monarchy founded the Reform Party in 1887. Native Hawaiians called it the Missionary Party. For Muscle, the Missionary Party established an all-white vigilante organization called the Honolulu Rifles. On July 6, 1887, the Honolulu Rifles seized the royal palace and handed King Kalakaua a new constitution. With his palace ringed by white soldiers with fixed bayonets, King Kalakaua signed the document. Hawaiians called it the Bayonet Constitution. Now Hawaii's king was a mere figurehead with little power. The Bayonet Constitution rejiggered voting rights with new property and income requirements. The result was the total exclusion of Asians as voters, and it granted whites three-fourths of the vote and only one-fourth to the native. In addition, the State Department ruled that American citizens could take an oath to support the new Hawaiian Constitution, vote in local elections, and still hold their American citizenship. Nowhere else in the world can an American citizen pledge allegiance to and vote in another country while still retaining their U.S. citizenship. This put the real Hawaiians in an impossible situation. Their king was powerless, their government was controlled by whites, and whenever it suited them, the whites could call themselves both Hawaiians and Americans. Benjamin Harrison was elected president in the same year that the Missionary Party gained control of the Hawaiian government. Harrison was the first president to travel across the country entirely over the Transcontinental Railroad. He believed that the Pacific beckoned as America's next step west. President Harrison appointed James Blaine as his Secretary of State. Blaine wrote to Harrison, I think there are only three places that are of value to be taken. One is Hawaii, and the others are Cuba and Puerto Rico, and Hawaii may come up for decision at any unexpected hour. America's golden hour in the Pacific arrived courtesy of a new monarch, Queen Liliuokalani, who had ascended to the throne in 1891. Queen Lily was determined to restore dignity to the Kingdom of Hawaiian and power to her people. In early 1893, Queen Lily promulgated a new constitution. It abolished the Bayonet Constitution and it restored power to the majority Hawaiians. The Missionary Party quickly convened a meeting downtown. The first order of business? Annexation of Hawaii to the United States. Over the next two days, the Missionary Party hatched their scheme with the U.S. Minister to Hawaii, John Stevens. Missionary Party members complained to Minister Stevens that they didn't have enough military force to topple the government, and if they tried, they feared arrest. Stevens promised them U.S. Marines, then aboard the USS Boston, anchored in Honolulu Harbor. This was a historical first. An American minister conspiring in regime change against a sovereign nation. The Missionary Party drafted an appeal to U.S. Minister Stevens in which they noted the general alarm and terror in Honolulu. The public safety is menaced and lives and property are in peril. We are unable to protect ourselves without aid and therefore we pray for the protection of United States forces. After signing this general alarm and terror document, 
Missionary party members adjourned for the day and ambled off through Honolulu's quiet streets for a nice long lunch. U.S. Minister Stevens boarded the USS Boston at 3 p.m. on January 16, 1893. He handed this written message to her captain. Sir, in view of existing critical circumstances in Honolulu, I request you to land Marines and sailors from the ship under your command. We need them to secure the safety of American life and property. Very truly yours, John Stevens, U.S. Minister. One hour later, 162 heavily armed United States Marines marched through Honolulu's peaceful streets. The only large group of Hawaiians to be found downtown were those enjoying the weekly Monday night Royal Hawaiian Band concert under the gazebo of the Hawaiian Hotel. The Marines made no effort to pretend that they had landed to secure the safety of Americans. Instead, they surrounded the royal palace and forced out Queen Lilio Kalani. The next day, representing the United States, U.S. Minister Stevens recognized the all-white Hawaiian provisional government. The new president of Hawaii was Sanford Dole, a son of missionaries, a white and blue-eyed American who founded the Dole Pineapple Company. At long last, there were no dark-skinned Hawaiians in the new Hawaiian government. U.S. Minister Stevens raised the American flag in Honolulu and declared Hawaii an American protectorate. Then, in a letter to the Secretary of State, Minister Stevens wrote, The Hawaiian pear is now fully ripe. And this is the golden hour for the United States to pluck it. But the missionary party and its provisional government had a problem back in Washington. There was a new president, Grover Cleveland, who refused to recognize Minister Stevens' regime change because it was set up without the assent of the people. Theodore Roosevelt was outraged. Indeed, it was this failure that sparked Roosevelt's interest in Pacific expansion. In 1896, Teddy fumed in the Century magazine, We should annex Hawaii immediately. It was a crime against the United States. It was a crime against white civilization not to annex it two and a half years ago. Fortunately for Teddy, a new president, William McKinley, had run on the platform that the Hawaiian Islands should be controlled by the United States. President McKinley submitted the Hawaiian Annexation Treaty to the U.S. Senate. The president said, Annexation is not a change. It is a consummation. Senator David Turpy objected. He believed that the native Hawaiians should be heard. He argued, There is a native population in the islands of about 40,000. They are not illiterate. They are not ignorant. A very large majority can read and write both languages, English and Hawaiian. Any treaty made without consulting the native Hawaiians should be withdrawn. But his was a minority viewpoint. Native Hawaiians were not to be heard in Washington, D.C. A more persuasive voice was that of the new Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt. Teddy wrote that if the United States did not annex Hawaii, it will show that we have lost the masterful instinct which alone can make a race great. I feel so deeply about it that I can hardly dare express myself in full. Export-minded U.S. businessmen had long imagined 400 million customers in China. Hawaii would be the American coaling station and naval base to get to those Chinese customers. In January of 1898, President McKinley declared that using the U.S. military to pry open foreign markets was a legitimate function of the U.S. government. Senator Cushman Davis proclaimed, the nation which controls Hawaii will control the great gateway of commerce to China. The United States was hardly the first to seek colonies abroad. By the end of the 19th century, Britain had 50 colonies, France 33, Germany 13. More than 98% of Polynesia was colonized, 90% of Africa, and more than 56% of Asia. Across this broad swath of the planet, only seven countries were still fully independent nations. Senator Henry Cabot Lodge expressed America's empire envy. The great nations of the world are rapidly absorbing all the waste spaces of the earth. It is a movement which makes for civilization and the advancement of the race. 
As one of the great nations of the world, the United States must not fall out of the line of march. The U.S. Army had brought America to the Pacific coast. It now passed the baton to the U.S. Navy. Captain Alfred Thayer Mahan, president of the newly founded Naval War College, lectured about the need for U.S. expansion. The U.S. Navy's traditional approach had been defensive. Mahan changed it to offensive. He said the U.S. Navy should seize strategic ports worldwide. He called these links in the chain of exchange by which wealth accumulates. The U.S. Navy, Captain Mahan said, could be great like the British if we concentrated our naval power at these links or pressure points around the world. By striking quickly and sharply at these nerve centers, the United States could paralyze whole oceans. To bring Asian booty back to the United States, Captain Mahan said the U.S. Navy must establish links in the Pacific, then cut a canal through Central America and make the Caribbean into an American lake. By the 1890s, a new generation of rebels around the world had arisen. They wanted to reclaim their homelands from the white Christian colonial powers. Spain was battling insurrections in both Cuba and the Philippines, and the Spanish Empire was weak. On February 15, 1898, when the USS Maine exploded in Havana Harbor, the Spanish islands of Puerto Rico, Guam, and the Philippines were suddenly in play. With Hawaii thrown in, the U.S. Navy could now grab the links necessary to obtain the riches of Asia. With Assistant Secretary Roosevelt beating the Tom Toms in Washington, Admiral George Duty in Hong Kong made plans to seize Manila. The May 1 Battle of Manila Bay was actually not much of a fight. On May 1st, Admiral Dewey's modern steel ships steamed into Manila Bay. Spain's creaky wooden ships were conveniently tied up in a row. It was a turkey shoot. The American cannon pounded Spain's wooden relics into kindling. The conflict was so one-sided that Dewey had his sailors break for a sit-down morning meal. After the breakfast dishes had been washed and dried, the U.S. Navy resumed its attack. After seizing the Spanish possessions of the Philippines and Guam, American eyes turned towards the island of Hawaii. One congressman declared, The annexation of the Hawaiian Islands is now presented to us as a war necessity. One historian wrote, Potential trade with China was the primary reason for the annexation of Hawaii. War with Spain was about the timing. On July 6, 1898, Congress passed the Hawaiian Annexation Resolution. President McKinley signed it the next day. The New York Sun newspaper cheered, The America of the 20th century has taken its first step towards the high rewards of manifest destiny. On August 12, 1898, in the Hawaiian Annexation Ceremony in Honolulu, President Sanford Dole formally handed over the former independent kingdom to the U.S. minister. America's first regime change was complete. White Americans applauded. Queen Lilio Kalani did not attend. America now had what Theodore Roosevelt and the naval expansionists had desired, a naval sluice to China from the east coast of America, through the Caribbean, across the Panama Canal, out to Hawaii, Guam, and the Philippines. As Assistant Secretary of the Navy, Theodore Roosevelt had been instrumental in seizing the naval links in the Caribbean and the Pacific to China. Then as president, Roosevelt seized Panama and carved out the connection between the two seas. As Teddy later admitted, I took the canal zone and let Congress debate. About the same thing can be said about the seizure of Hawaii. Every year on the anniversary of the American annexation, Queen Lilio Kalani would gather with her friends, and they would sing Hawaiian songs and cry. The story of America's first regime change, which I have just told you, comes from my third book, The Imperial Cruise. I wrote that book in my apartment in Honolulu's Foster Tower. It overlooks Waikiki Beach. Every morning about 5 a.m. I would get up, I would go outside, get a cup of coffee, return to my writing desk, and then I would write from about 6 a.m. to noon. 
I had a perfect view of Waikiki Bay. And right in front of me, straight out into Waikiki Bay, was a set of waves that the surfers loved called Queen's Break. And I would watch the surfers on Queen's Break all morning, couldn't wait to get there. I'd finish my writing, have lunch, and then go out and surf Queen's Break all afternoon. Only later did I learn that Queen's Break was named after Queen Lily Okalani. I had been living and writing a book about this woman on the property where she had lived, where she had cried about America's first regime change. <laughs> 